downtown Berlin. Um, so in that context, beginning about two years ago, just before uh, March of 2020, um, uh, Valerie and her colleagues reached out to us and asked, would we be interested to partner with them to begin to think about how the climate might affect the future of Cape Ann and to think a little bit about how uh, you know, Cape Anners might think about that um, to begin to look at what that future might be. Um, and so we agreed and over the course of uh, this year, we're engaging as Dick has mentioned, uh, a, a year long study. We're about halfway done. Uh, and we thought it would be a good chance to both um, test drive it with you, get some feedback on it. Um, the first thing to say is that, you know, we're not here to speak uh, on behalf of the future of Cape Ann. Um, you know, its future will be decided by, by you good folk. Um, uh, we do have a couple of, um, you know, a uh, couple of points that we can share with you, which has been our perspective working with other communities elsewhere with respect to climate. Um, and at the same time, we're, this is one piece of a larger effort. Um, they are organizing uh, EPA building block workshops, for example. We've engaged a number of both academic and professional experts. We've reached out to a number of elected and appointed officials. And we've been talking to as many people as we can, both on the Cape, but also elsewhere in the world. Um, we also are joined by Professor Gareth Doherty of the Design School. Uh, Professor Gareth Doherty has uh, full-time uh, research assistants working uh, on Cape Ann, doing field work, interviews, ethnographic research. So this is really just the beginning of a longer term uh, project. And we're not here with any, uh, any answers or even any conclusions at this point. We simply wanted to share with you our, our thought process and uh, get your reflections uh, on it. So the, the first thing to say is that um, our research group, we're at the design school. So we are architects and landscape architects and urban designers and urban planners and engineers. And uh, our research group, uh, the Office for Urbanization, uh, our primary mission is to work with communities around the world and to try to help them to imagine, to visualize uh, their choices uh, and to bring to those choices the best available uh, peer review, literature, precedent projects uh, from around the world. Um, we do this on a variety of topics, but uh, the adaptation to climate change has become a particular uh, expertise of ours. Um, in this regard, we will be talking about um, planning scenarios and I'll define those in a variety of ways. But before we start, um, I wanted to share with you first, the, the first thing we did, which was about a year and a half ago now, which is to begin to understand Cape Ann as really um, a cultural landscape or one thing as opposed to four municipalities. Now, I know you all live not in you know, four towns, but you live in dozens and dozens of particular neighborhoods. Uh, and there's a level of granularity, specificity to that that's quite important. From the point of view of climate change, we know that um, you know, the increasing storm events, the rising seas, the kind of changing of climate atmosphere will affect everything on Cape Ann, um, but it will do so over a very long period of time. And that's one of our challenges. From that point of view, um, there's very little that Cape Ann could do um, to mitigate the implications of climate change. Even if you immediately converted to a, an all electric decarboned economy, it would be very difficult to stop the climate change that's already in the system. And from that point of view, the future in this part of the world will see seas rising faster than in many other parts of the world for a variety of reasons. Um, in that context, from a geophysical point of view, from a, a hydrological point of view, from a climatological point of view, we think of Cape Ann as one thing. Of course, it's much more than that, but in that context, uh, it's important to understand that Cape Ann's settlement pattern, it originated from the water side first. And because of that, and the extensivity of that water's edge, um, you know, it makes the Cape quite vulnerable to these changes. Um, of course, each of these four municipalities and the dozens of communities that you live in are quite distinct and different. And at the same moment, we find that you share quite a lot in terms of infrastructure, resources, and ways forward. Um, many people are drawn to the Cape um, because of the extraordinary beauty, the power of the place. And that's something that we're here to, to reinforce and to keep ourselves kind of perpetually reminded of that we simply don't want to neglect that that power of the ocean and being in proximity to that water is an important part of that experience. Uh, 
At the same moment, KFAN has an extraordinarily diverse set of uh, classes, uh, different uh, ethnic and immigrant groups over time, but also a range of very, very different ways of life in a fairly uh, small geographic area. Compared to other communities that we work with, uh, Cape Ann and present company included, have in fact done much more than many places that we talk to uh, in terms of education about green infrastructure, thinking about new economies, uh, moving away toward renewables from the uh, carbon economy, et cetera. And in that regard, of course, we think that the leadership of the, uh, the um, Town Green, the leadership of the Gloucester Meeting House Foundation is indicative uh, in this regard. Um, but what I wanna leave you with here in this section is there's a lot more to be said, but more so than four municipalities, um, we will think of Cape Ann in terms of six distinct cultural landscapes. And by landscapes, we mean both the natural and the cultural. On the one hand, there are operating and ongoing and working farms. Uh, that's ag agricultural history. They include you know, woodlots and pasture and tilled crops and a range of other activities that are increasingly under threat. Of course, the history of the place has been built upon the working waterfronts, the kind of both industrial, but also maritime economy, the fisheries and the like. Uh, of course, the economy of the place has been built upon the notion of retreat and uh, vista, the idea of an economy around tourism and leisure uh, and the idea of being on the water. But then of course, infrastructures that tie all that together and back to other uh, places in the region. Um, in that context, the destination tourism, the recreational lifestyle, the <coughs> desire to you know, continue to live and work in this place is present for us. And we know that you've already begun to experience uh, both sea level rise uh, and storm events. And this is happening in the context of an extraordinary uh, ecological uh, diversity, uh, just an enormous abundance of natural life uh, in the way that we think of it. In those contexts, uh, what we do most often is a form of scenario planning. Um, so scenario planning is a method of long-term planning that creates uh, possible futures. Uh, in this regard, the key idea here is that we're not here to predict a singular outcome, but it's more a thought exercise. What we're trying to do is work through a plausible future so as to shed light on present day decision-making uh, the IPCC, the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, has endorsed this kind of scenario planning as a way to help us think about the future. Uh, in that context, you might think about scenario planning as one side of a coin. The other side is most often thought about as a probabilistic model of change. So in that regard, think about two ways of approaching climate in the future of Cape Ann. On the one hand, there is excellent data available in statistical probabilities so that each landowner, each institution, each individual can have access to quite good scientific data about the statistical likelihood of future inundations, sea level rise and storm events. The strength of that approach, that statistical approach is that it's very good in terms of amortizing risk it's very good in uh, leveraging you know, mortgage values or reinsurance markets. It's also got the kind of uh, the certainty of statistical analysis. The downside to that approach is that it's very hard to visualize. It's often very hard to imagine a spreadsheet of risk, right? And so we think of statistical probability modeling on the one hand and scenario planning on the other as both important and complementary uh, methodological approaches. Um, scenario planning and the way that we pursue it is also not meant to be uh, indicative of any decision making going forward. That is, simply because we tease out a scenario, that doesn't suggest that scenario is likely or desirable, but rather is plausible. And the goal here, again, is to reveal our uh, unconscious biases and blind spots, to place a kind of pressure on the present situation so as to reveal what might change and in which ways. Um, our work is organized this year, and we're about halfway through it, uh, as Dick mentioned, in the course of a, a series of topics. What we call a scenario zero, and I'll share with you just briefly, is uh, a scenario that assumes a steady state. Let's assume that nothing changes. Let's assume that we do nothing, we simply proceed. Uh, we know that the seas are rising, increasing storm events, increasing severity of storm events. We often uh, pursue a scenario zero 
to sort of reveal through a kind of stress test the existing situation to reveal its vulnerabilities, but also to help us think through uh, where our limitations or our gaps might be. This is an ongoing and participative activity. The information that we take in tonight, the information from workshops next week and over the course of the summer and the fall will continue to feed into this. So it's meant to be more of an ongoing conversation about these things to somehow reveal a future potentialities. From that work, we've moved into what we call a scenario one, which is one look at um, a kind of high level approach to thinking about adaptation through the region. And then over the course of the next couple of months, we'll be doing two smaller studies, one looking at um, carbon or net zero housing, and another looking at waste recovery and in particular kind of shifting your waste systems off of carbon economies. I'll say a word about format. Um, so the work that we're doing comes from multiple sources. And of course, you know, the academic rigor of that is quite important to us. And we kind of diligently footnote that material, and then we produce it in three forms. The first form is this in a conversation or presentation and then discussion and Q&A, that's one form. The second form is what you see on the screen just now, which is the form of a website. These are websites that we build so as to make uh, our work available to broader audiences. And then third will be uh, a final report that we'll publish in September, and we'll hold some events and conversations around once we have uh, completed this first year of study and we have some recommendations. In scenario zero, we're interested to look at a future event, a storm event in which we imagine, well, what are the vulnerabilities of Cape Ann? How has Cape Ann changed over the course of the next decade or more with respect to um, uh, increasing storm events? Uh, we've chosen this for a couple of reasons. One, because we know that uh, tropical storms and hurricanes are increasingly likely in this part of the world. Uh, they're also increasingly uh, devastating. Uh, now, we don't wish uh, you know, a hurricane on anyone. Um, I grew up in Florida. We tracked hurricanes on the refrigerator door every hurricane season. It's not something I wish on anyone. And our purpose here is not to anticipate or predict or subject uh, us to, to you know, that prospect. The goal of this is a little bit like going to your cardiologist and having a stress test. The goal is not to have a cardiac event on the treadmill. The goal is to use the test to reveal something diagnostic, right? And if we do this right, we'll also surface thinking, second order thinking, third order thinking about what you know, the future might hold. Um, in that context, we've done quite a lot of work looking at the history of storm events in this part of the world. And we've modeled uh, a good dozen hurricanes of which one, the one from 1938, so-called Great New England Hurricane, has been quite informative. Um, this is a storm that in contemporary terms would be something like a middling hurricane, something like a category two, category three uh, tropical storm that becomes a hurricane that re results in both loss of life, but also billions of dollars of damage. It's not a direct hit and it's in no way the worst case scenario. Uh, our particular storm uh, arrives in September of 2038 after the rainiest summer in a couple of decades. Uh, and it begins with a tropical storm that forms um, off of Cape Verde in mid-August and then follows a fairly, you know, kind of, kind of well-known track up through and into uh, coastal New England, Massachusetts. A part of the reason that we do this work is we're trying to understand um, from a, a granular level, like on the ground, what will be the likely impact. And so one of the things we do is we, we partner um, with uh, people that have you know, great data, great science. We partner with ecologists and real estate developers and planners and people about in engineering and infrastructure. And in that, what we're doing often is we're trying to model to simulate, well, what will likely happen given a projection for sea level rise, given a projection for a particular storm event. Um, and a part of what we're doing here is trying to understand uh, vulnerabilities. Um, in this case, you see here a, a kind of aerial view of uh, Gloucester's yes. Inner Harbor. So, if, if for any reason, any chance you are watching this show, I will mail you some land. I'm just gonna cook these for about- yeah, can, you, can you put everybody on mute? Hour? Do you know how to do that? Anything of a better. Sorry, Dick, you're muted, but if you click on the little three dots uh, in someone's frame, you can mute them. Um, 
yeah, I've, I think I have. So like everybody <laughs> seems to be muted except Charles. I don't know who that was. Thanks. Um, so the, the point here is to, again, not, not wish any ill will on Gloucester's Inner Harbor, but rather to say that, you know, increasing storm events are statistically uh, likely. Uh, we know that, um, you know, future storms are inevitable everywhere and, and, and certainly thinking about one uh, that, um, that helps us to understand the vulnerabilities of this part of the world. We're trying to model both, you know, sea level rise, but also storm event. Uh, wave action and a range of secondary and tertiary outcomes. So often in urban environments, you know, the first order outcome, which is the water overtops, whatever protection there is, that's pretty clear and self-evident. Uh, the challenge often becomes the secondary and the tertiary systems in which um, water ends up in some non-linear, non-obvious places. We've done this modeling for all of Cape Ann, as well as for the four uh, kind of core kind of municipalities. Um, here you can see in this case, uh, Rockport and uh, a similarly timed uh, storm event. Uh, you can see on the right there, we're kind of tracking a kind of um, a model of barometric pressure, an amount of storm surge, uh, an amount of total rainfall, a wind speed and a direction, as well as the rel relative tides um, and the combination of those things on um, the conditions on the ground. Um, uh, ultimately, having done this work with a range of environments, you know, elsewhere. What we can say is that on the one hand, you know, Cape Ann has this extraordinary diversity of coastline, which means it's vulnerable in a variety of orientations. Um, it's also true that much of your infrastructure, much of your key infrastructure in response to a storm, uh, may be at the wrong elevation. It may be in a floodplain. It may have been built in a marsh. This kind of thing. Uh, for example, here we're looking at Manchester by the Sea Town Hall. Uh, wastewater treatment plant overwhelmed by water and the town's emergency operations center uh, being relocated after the generator is flooded. This kind of thing is, is now, um, you know, kind of evident in the literature. And we've been working both with Harvard faculty as well as professional and academic experts from a range of institutions to learn from the storm events in other places. Here you can see um, uh, this portion on the north side, Northern Konoma Point uh, and a comparable kind of modeling. Uh, there. Now, as I mentioned, the modeling that we're doing is really complementary to a more kind of statistical probability basis. Individual actors, uh, individual institutions, uh, and individual families are already making decisions about their future in this part of the world, uh, irrespective of a storm. So what we want to suggest is that we, we don't need to wait for a storm event to begin thinking in this way, but already the cape is changing and already people are beginning to make different or individual uh, decisions. Um, we complement that storm modeling with a series of these kinds of drawings, which are more on the ground, let's say, where we're looking at um, key infrastructures. We've identified 27 key pieces of infrastructure, key uh, sites across the Cape, in, awesome. and when tried to model what were the implications of the storm event for that particular place. In this case, you can see where the uh, kind of storm crests over dog bar at the light. Um, you know, the stop and shop plaza will be a key moment or a key node in this kind of any future storm event. And the fact that it's itself you know, in a wetland is, is probably an interesting thing to keep track of here, given that the wetlands will play an important role in bolstering or building resilience on Cape Ann. Uh, we'll also spend some more time talking in a few minutes about the wastewater treatment system, uh, both the freshwater uh, system, but also water treatment across the Cape is interesting in this regard, as are uh, subsurface infrastructures. You can see this is Gulf Oil on Beach Street, in which case we're concerned or interested in what's going on with respect to tanks and subsurface infrastructures in the wake of a storm event. Uh, I think many of you will be kind of uh, familiar with uh, Long Beach and the precarity, the relative precarity of Long Beach. And uh, while, of course, we, we don't wish any ill will on Long Beach, we know that obviously the future of changing climate, the future storm events on Long Beach will face, you'll, you'll face a number of questions there and there'll be a range of different points of view about how to think about that. Uh, and at the same moment, there are certain places, particularly centers of the economy, in this case, Woodman's Landing, Essex Causeway, that will be already subject to storm event on some regular basis. <clears throat> Again, the idea is not to you know, suggest that this is inevitable or that we wish any ill will, simply trying to use the idea of storms that have occurred elsewhere or that are likely to occur here as a way to kind of 
charge the system to think about what's vulnerable, to reveal second order thinking, and to help us to imagine, well, how might we prepare for a future in which we know that there will be increased uh, sea level rises and increased storm events, increased energy in those storms. The second thing that we've done in addition to that piece of work has been then to provide a kind of outline, a kind of sketch about, well, how should we then think about these conditions? Um, we've then begun this work on what we call scenario one, which we're referring to as near future adaptations. One of the challenges with thinking about climate is that we know that it's changing, but no one really agrees on what pace. And at certain points well in the future, our ability to predict precisely gets out of focus. Having said that, the general trajectory seems clear. And so we're benchmarking in this study 2030, 2050, and 2070 as key dates on the horizon that we can discuss. We begin that work with a couple of principles. Um, the first principle is that climate change will impact all of us, every institution, public, private, every individual, every, in, in various ways. And therefore no single strategy can protect um, a place like Cape Ann from coastal flooding and its impacts. So we have to think of a portfolio or a menu of strategies and that these strategies will be developed uh, by multiple actors and agents over time. We also observe um, that there is the great danger that those adaptation measures are only for the wealthy or the privileged that historically has often been the case, particularly in our culture where those with resources, those that have voice politically, those that are already having wealth somehow can protect themselves. Whereas others across the region are rendered even more vulnerable. And our goal would be to advocate for a regional approach and one based in equity to the extent we can articulate that. We would also observe, uh, and we can also discuss this if, if there's a, a difference of opinion about it. The premise here would be that, especially on a place like Cape Ann, um, the resources available, uh, public, private, large, small, will necessarily be stretched. And given the extraordinary extensivity of coastline, uh, those resources will necessarily be bounded in certain ways. And so very quickly, we'll be in a place where we'll have to think about, well, how do we wanna think about a place who's you know, among its primary characteristics is the extraordinary diversity and extensivity of shoreline. And at the same moment, uh, defending all of it or protecting all of it or keeping it all of it exactly where it is today is going to be increasingly challenging uh, from both a political and a financial point of view. Um, another thing that you find in the literature or on these topics, if you talk to people who do this kind of work in other places, what they'll tell you is that um, as climates change, they both do so slowly, but then also catastrophically. And those systems that fail can have a kind of rippling effect that becomes often uh, systemic. Uh, most often these things are not so clear until they're in the wake of a storm event when it's revealed that you know, post Superstorm Sandy, for example, that the mechanisms to close you know, floodgates were there. But at the same moment, uh, the you know, MBTA you know, uh, um, generators were at the wrong elevation, for example. So it's the interconnection of these systems that are typically sorted in different organizations, different administrations. And the breakdown of one piece within that system has a cascading effect on other aspects in that infrastructural network. Um, on the one hand, um, you know, local governments, and we're talking about the four municipalities, uh, play a role here, the county, uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, the federal government, but of course, you know, civil society, uh, NGOs, not-for-profits, uh, civic organizations and the like all play a role. And at the same moment, we find in the literature, there are certain things that the public sector can do. Uh, and we would imagine would inform recommendations that we might make uh, in the future as we pursue this work uh, more fully. In order to think through, well, how might we start to approach this thinking about change in the future on the Cape? We've organized ourselves and are thinking into seven sub scenarios. Uh, and again, just for brevity, we're not going to share with you with all of them, um, but just briefly to kind of introduce these to you. Uh, we started with, first of all, a series of flood projections based upon the storm modeling that we did as a kind of baseline. Now, again, um, you know, we don't 
um, spend a lot of time, you know, kind of debating, you know, which hydrologic modeling software to use or this projection or that. Of course, we can do that. Our goal is to spend less time focusing on which of those projections and more on the, the, the overwhelming likelihood that as seas uh, rise and as storms increase, that these kinds of issues will become increasingly chronic on the Cape. Now, uh, the timeline in which they do so and how individuals respond to them is a much more open uh, question. Um, what we've got here is the beginning of a series of analytical drawings, maps that we've made for thinking about vulnerability. And rather than thinking about vulnerability from simply one measure or one metric, one way to build some robustness into this kind of work is to use multiple measures or models. One measure that we quite often rely upon would be the location of historic wetlands or marshes. Uh, those are important because most often they are the places that will both go back to being wet. Uh, they will also tend to be places that can be helpful in rebuilding resilience from a natural systems point of view. Uh, you can see over here on the right at the bottom, kind of different shades of different history of wetlands and when they were kind of erased. You can also see on the left, the numbers of structures, uh, number of buildings, each one of those little house diagrams being 10. So right now there's something like 900 structures that are in or on top of what were historically uh, wetlands. Another indication that's useful for this purpose will be to look at places that are on filled land. Now, of course, much of the world, uh, much, of, um, uh, much of Boston, in fact, right across the river here has been built on filled land. And we know that that's quite perfectly possible to be maintained in perpetuity. It's been our experience in this case that the extensivity of filled land, just the sheer amount of it, its distribution and the numbers of structures on that filled land, filled land becomes a useful surrogate for us for thinking about change. Again, in part in a trade-off between spending time, energy, money, resources to fortress, to bolster, to armor, to protect that filled land. The physics behind that is not, you know, rocket science. You know, the, the Dutch have been living underwater for, uh, you know, for centuries. That it's not that complicated. It's the political decision making and the intensity of collective resources required to maintain that filled level and to elevate it over time and to protect it from sea level. That's really the investment. And in that regard, we also know that the history of these filled areas is turning them into wetlands will help us with respect to storm resilience and the ability to bounce back. Even more fundamentally, we would think uh, another way of approaching this would be to look at the federal emergency management um, and FEMA's you know, national flood hazard layers. Now, again, each one of these layers are a different approach to the same or similar issues. And we can debate which one is best and which one is most applicable or which one might be most appropriate for each particular decision maker. But we find each of these layers to be building up a kind of picture in a way of vulnerability to give us a kind of roadmap. Um, in this context, you know, you can see also here a gradation of light gray to darker gray organized around um, high risk to lower risk, right? Um, in this case, we're interested in the notion of the, you know, 1% event, the once in a so-called century uh, storm event. And then to that, we're also looking at, um, in this model, we're looking at storm surge, that is where does the water from our 2038 storm get to ultimately? Um, and then projections for sea level rise at 2030, 2050, and 2070. So again, each of those layers, you might think of them as kind of slides of a microscope. No one of those layers should dictate the future of Cape Ann, but collectively they give us a pretty clear picture of a place that was built around the waterfront in which the waterfront is both the economy, but it's also the lived experience, it's the cultural memory, it's the meaning, it's in part what makes the place so powerful and meaningful for everyone. But it also produces an extraordinary amount of vulnerability with respect to increased sea level rises and storm events. So from that point of view, again, uh, you know, we're, well, we're well away from any you know, judgments or recommendations even, we're simply trying to get a picture, a diagnosis of what we think is the, is the context. Um, We've begun just briefly these seven sub scenarios that I'll leave you with. Um, and these are indicative approaches that are in the literature. They're based on precedent projects from around the world. And each one has something to say about the way forward for us. The first 
And the most obvious thing to say would be, well, let's just armor, let's just build up and defend. And in fact, for many centuries, people on Cape Han have been doing just that. Um, in the context of uh, you know sea level rise, we're interested in both so-called gray infrastructure. That means you know breakwaters, bulkheads, jetties, you know uh, durable civil engineering structures, often built kind of uh, with with uh, kind of uh, you know, durable materials. But we're also interested in so-called green infrastructure, the idea of you know, rebuilding resilient wetlands, barrier beaches, dunes, marshlands, uh, using a combination of gray and green. Um, this combination is really the playbook of almost every both academic and professional study that's out there. It's also the best practice that we find around the world with respect to anticipating and responding to. So in the context of adaptation, to sea level rise, storm event, and climate change, we're thinking of both hard systems and soft in combination because they, they both do different things and they're both relevant. And in this regard, we're, we'll accompany our recommendations with a whole range of precedent projects and literature and sources to build upon. Um, now, in that case, of course, we've also surveyed the available uh, research reports and proposals and studies that have been made already that's a part of our function is to gather all of those into one place to somehow summarize them and to think about them systematically. And on that list of major projects, we're not gonna go through all of them clearly, but for example, in this case, the idea of some, some major projects, some big storm surge barriers, some big hurricane barriers, and the bolstering of kind of uh, restoring wetlands so as to allow for greater resilience certainly is on our mind. Um, you may be familiar with proposals that have already been made by others with respect to uh, hurricane uh, barriers protecting Gloucester's Harbor. And of course, uh, without making any judgments about these, we see that there have been proposals like this for a larger outer harbor hurricane barrier uh, with backed up with systems on, uh, on the backside and rebuilt marshes. You can see here an estimate for the number of the thousand structures being protected by that. You can see here in this projection, we've again modeled, kind of hydrologically modeled, where that water would go, where that storm event might land, where that sea level rise might get to, and try to suggest, well, we're looking at that large infrastructure project. That's probably the biggest one that's been studied seriously for Cape Ann, and it's one that would protect a thousand structures, uh, health and safety of the livelihood of thousands of people, but also uh, an enormous economic uh, GDP. Um, there have also, as you know, been proposals by others to study smaller barriers, those that are more inner harbor based, uh, that will, you know, protect something like 10% of that larger, uh, or 20% of that larger uh, volume, uh, and would come at much less environmental cost, uh, much less financial expense, and much less, uh, much less upkeep. The key concept here for us is, of course, we're open to looking and evaluating these larger high infrastructural systems. One of the challenges is, of course, that the you know, climate change is sort of an ongoing process. That is, each time these kinds of systems are contemplated, they're very, very large. They require massive funding. They involve great infrastructural disruption, both environmental disruption, but also social disruption. They also um, tend to need to be maintained and rebuilt and elevated over time, for example. So the, the Charles River Dam that's just down the river here from my house in Cambridge has about 18 inches of freeboard left on it. And right now people are studying, well, what should we do? Should we increase the height of that? Should we move it further out toward the airport? That kind of thing. Again, without making any value judgments or recommendations about them, uh, you may be familiar that studies have been made with respect to armoring uh, the, the, the harbor of Manchester by the sea. In this case, the village core and a much more modest number of structures, but a significant one in which the MBTA tracks uh, and the kind of bascule bridge alignment are important. Uh, this other context for Rockport, which is a much more exposed kind of northeastern vantage, uh, a much uh, smaller number of structures, but equally a much larger extensive system. And what we're looking at in this case is both hard systems, but also the idea of rebuilding wetlands and marshes on the backside, but equally uh, building, you know, living breakwaters on the waterfront. This is something that's in our field quite, um, quite contemporary thinking. Um, and a part of what we're looking at will be like, okay, people, other engineers have proposed these things, these things are being studied without making a value judgment about them. We attempt to say, well, what would that mean for living here? Like, what would it look like on the ground? You know, how big of a change might that be? Um, in our work in climate adaptation uh, around the world and around the country, we find 
the physics of this, the engineering of it is, it's manageable. These things are not that difficult to understand. The challenge becomes in harboring or building a kind of harbor protection system or an armoring or defense or retreat, oftentimes you can effectively change the visual quality or character of the place that you live in, both the building structures, the landscapes. Uh, this was our experience working in South Florida. We've been for the past decade working in South Florida, Miami, Miami Beach. Miami Beach has had perhaps the most aggressive program I'm aware of, uh, 400 million US dollars for a relatively small town to elevate their public realm, to pump and pipe their way to stay dry. They have water in the streets every month. Uh, and that program runs the risk of really changing the quality of that place. Uh, the touristic economy, the quality of life in that place is based upon the cultural heritage there and the engineering can do much damage to that. And so a lot of our thinking right now is how do we think about these hard and soft systems in a way to produce resilience, but also to allow Cape Ann to still be Cape Ann, to be both recognizable, but also uh, sustainable uh, going forward. Uh, you can see here in this case, um, uh, the Gloucester High School edge and the idea of necessarily thinking about armoring, elevation, building some hard infrastructure, but also building uh, green infrastructure around that and building a public realm that's still going to be desirable and legibly uh, Cape Ann. Of course, as we do this, we know that many of your critical infrastructures, many of your supply systems and networks are maybe vulnerable as well. That might include, you know, fresh water, sewerage, uh, elect the electrical grid. Uh, many of these infrastructures are at or below sea level right now. Many of them are built in wetlands, marsh, and many of them will be vulnerable going forward. Uh, in this regard, of course, this is something that's already on the minds of uh, town planners and elected and appointed officials. It's already on the minds in many of the engineering studies that have been done. But of course, um, they pose real challenges going forward. Um, among the options that you might consider, you'll think about you know, buffering or protecting fresh water, uh, elevating berms, dikes, or seawalls to defend infrastructures such as the high school or the wastewater treatment plant, uh, elevating systems such as the MBTA latrine line itself, uh, doubling up and building more uh, re resilient kind of supply systems, uh, relocating ultimately, planning for relocation over multiple decades to in effect move out of harm's way. These are the kinds of things that are being studied in other cities around the country. One of the great resources that you possess is this extraordinary infrastructure of public drinking water. Uh, your water supply system as it is in these reservoirs and is an extraordinary resource to have it on site on the Cape is something that we would recommend you maintain and not lose sight of. Uh, these freshwater reservoirs are already and will continually be under threat from salinization, but also encroaching development. As we play out this kind of scenario, this game plan, what we find is having your own water supply is an enormous asset and we would encourage you to defend that at all costs. In fact, we think that we will probably ultimately recommend extending the buffer zones to protect them environmentally from saline intrusion, but also to maintain the security of that ultimately going forward. Your critical you know, electrical infrastructures are quite well known, I think as well, given the kind of extremity of Cape Ann, where your electrical lines come in from. I know that you have some periodical electrical outages already, but we've done a, a thorough mapping and kind of inventory of where those substations and those drop down uh, generators are and identified places where you simply might wanna think about change over time and started to look at examples from around the country where uh, people are simply elevating those structures to keep pace with or ahead of increased storm events and sea level rise. Similarly, we mentioned wastewater. That's gonna be one of our longer studies this summer. The idea of you know, having all that fresh water is great. The wastewater system that you have is, is a little bit of an historic assemblage. Um, both Gloucester and Manchester treatment plants are vulnerable already and are being defended, but we would encourage us to kind of accelerate that, to advocate for that. And ultimately to sort of think about consolidating those activities together and thinking about a place that will be more defensible over a longer period of time. And then again, as we're thinking about those things and talking to folks on Cape Ann, we're also trying to imagine, well, what might that look like? What, what could that possible scenario be? In this case, uh, the Essex County Golf Club being encouraged to uh, store water. I think one of the challenges in this kind of work is that you'll find yourself living with the water for longer periods of time and wanting to store. Many places are storing that on the surface, 
places that are really pressed for development, don't have a lot of arable land, you might find underground storage or other systems. On a place like Cape Ann, we find that the hardening or defense of the coastline, the retreat from key infrastructures into the interior, the protection of your key infrastructures, all this starts to take up valuable land and tends to already reinforce what's a fairly, um, a fairly tough housing market in terms of access to housing. This of course leads us to thinking about the transportation networks. Uh, we mentioned the train line, of course, the kind of elevation of the rail line and the, the reconstruction of the Bastille Bridge at a higher elevation and with the kind of floodgate mechanism, that seems like one of the engineering solutions that's been proposed that we should think long and hard about. In this context, of course, most of the transportation on Cape Ann is, is automobile based. It will be so through our 2070 scenario. Um, and whether those automobiles are fueled by electricity or by, um, by, by gasoline or diesel is sort of irrelevant, given that the infrastructure is what's quite vulnerable. Uh, again, we've identified a range of precedents from around the country in which uh, certain places are looking to simply realign or move the alignments of roadways to raise their profile, to build bridges or causeways to stay up out of the water, to deploy barriers, and in certain places really in extremity to simply disinvest, to stop maintaining and to allow to be abandoned ultimately. Um, the transportation networks you know better than I do, they're uh, well known and historically uh, significant in a number of places, but just by way of an example, for example, uh, Route 128, a key lifeline uh, relative to the floodplain from the Andrew Piet Bridge and the Grant Circle Interchange, for example, that's a place where these forces will be intersecting going forward and that we might wanna think about your options ultimately. Um, similarly, if you look here at Thatcher Road, Good Harbor, that's another in, 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 in intersection between transportation network, storm event, and the need to rebuild wetlands to build greater resilience. You can see here the Essex Causeway and the idea of, well, how much causeway do we have? Um, and then ultimately, how can we rebuild a kind of landscape of resilience and biological activity, both flora and fauna, you know, uh, but also uh, the ability to absorb storm energy. You know, it's one of the remarkable things about wetlands is their capacity to absorb storm energy and the relationship between the wetland behind the beach historically is something that's been lost in many parts of this country. Thinking about a more kind of residential neighborhood, you know, thinking about innovative strategies to hold water, in this case, bioswales to absorb those storm events, let that water be held underground to keep it out of harm's way. Which leads us, of course, to thinking about ultimately elevating certain portions of the public realm. Um, this is something that, again, Miami Beach has been at the forefront of. Uh, Miami Beach has innovated what they call the street three-step program. Those three steps are three eight inch steps, three eight inch risers that get you 24 inches of public realm elevation. And they're doing that in a series of phases. Um, in this regard, of course, this is something that will you know, be in response to events going forward in the future. And our role here is simply to identify precedents and examples from around the country that might be useful as you think about that. Um, we've identified a range of different you know, kind of cultural uh, destinations, especially the kind of the high high streets or the kind of, you know, commercial strips. In this case, um, Smith Cove, this rocky neck stretch is also quite extreme already. Uh, and as we think about that, and as we apply best practices, what we're showing here is, let's say, just for the sake of argument, if, um, if, uh, if Cape Ann were to decide that, well, we're simply going to elevate our major infrastructures, our primary public realm, our sidewalks and our streets in our major uh, kind of a central business district, a major marketplace by two feet every two decades. Now that's on the one hand, a major undertaking, but it would be enough to keep you ahead of the projections that we see as most plausible. Um, in other contexts, you might think about precedents for elevation, so getting up on stilts. This is something that across the United States has been vernacular in many parts of the world. It's been less common, although sometimes common uh, in New England. And similarly, you might think about certain places where, well, in this case, Manchester by the sea, the combination of elevating the central business district, the central town square, but then also defensive gates, the MBTA, Bascule Bridge being rebuilt with surge gates, kind of the combination of those three acts plus rebuilding the resilient capacity of the wetland will build resilience in a, in a kind of collective way. And there's a way to do that, which maintains the architectural and cultural character of the place, I think it's important to say. 
Um, now, there are other places in this case in Essex that are much more challenging in terms of the distribution of uh, both commercial and residential along already um, you know, qu qu quite extreme infrastructures. And in those kinds of contexts, elevation and relocation will be something that individuals will make decisions about. <coughs> In so doing, we also want to encourage and reinforce, we want to use natural systems as much as possible. Uh, the existing, you know, granite outcropping, the existing salt marshes, the existing uh, marine beaches, these are all natural systems that have been arrested or held in place for a period of time. And oftentimes we can use those natural systems to help armor and defend and protect a place like Cape Ann. What we call accelerating natural adaptations means thinking about how the rebuilding of the same beach every year is ultimately a center for cultural memory and, and collective experience. It's also a center economically, but it also may at some point become unsustainable from simply an economic and, and physical point of view. Uh, one of the studies that we've been doing that we hope to continue next year is a study of the various uh, biological systems, the biomes, the various landscape biomes on Cape Ann. This is just an initial map of that. It's as you know, an extraordinary beautiful place, but also an extraordinarily diverse place. And in this very short study, we've just looked at two aspects of that, the historic wetlands and the beaches. Of course, as you all know, I mean, the beaches are among the extraordinary kind of um, uh, resources of a place like Cape Ann, uh, dozens and dozens of them. And some of them are quite stable and more or less sustainable. Others are shrinking very, very quickly, as you know, others are pres presumably growing or potentially could be reinforced and could grow. So, for example, I know many of you are already thinking about Good Harbor Beach, which is retreating at something like a foot a year. Now, on the one hand, that process, you can simply bring in more and more sand through uh, beach replenishment or nourishment. That's a practice that ultimately we believe is um, you know, counterproductive. Of course, it'll buy you a few years, but we would recommend something like living breakwaters, so natural systems to reduce the impact of wave action and storm event, allowing the beach to retreat, but then restoring marshland behind it, which is a little bit more of the, the natural systems that were there originally. So in this case, of course, we can armor that with some hard infrastructure, but in a section like this, the hard infrastructure is often used in a series of layers. So one layer will be natural breakwaters, providing marine habitat out in the saline environment, mitigating wave action, protecting the beach, the beach itself as a constructed dune system, using kind of native plantings and allowing ecosystems to return, and then enhancing the wetlands behind. That combination of things will, of course, change the nature of those places a little bit closer to what they were historically. At the same moment, there are a range of other cases that we've looked at, including, including uh, Singing Beach, which itself is retreating at a slightly more modest rate, in which case something more simple, simply like stabilizing the coastal bank and engineering the shoreline might be appropriate in this context. Um, I'll spare you the tour of your very own beaches, but I know many of you have already brought up with us your, your passionate interest in Long Beach. Uh, that's of course a central question. It's not gonna be decided by, uh, by us for sure. And it's not even gonna be decided in, in, in any near term way, but the idea of these hundred or so houses and how they move forward, I think will be a central case study for how Cape Ann responds. Uh, in this case on Good Harbor, you can see in this section, a series of engineering systems, hard and soft combining to provide a kind of resilience, but which maintains the kind of look and feel of the place and something recognizable as Cape Ann. Um, one topic that we do wanna mention that I know is on, 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 on the minds of, of many of you and many of our colleagues in the field is, we don't really believe, it's certainly in this context in New England, we don't really believe that there's a thing called managed retreat. Um, uh, it's both uh, socially kind of not really commensurate with our experience in New England. It's also not, uh, taking into consideration the fact that individuals and institutions are already pricing into their choices these kinds of forces. So there's no starting gun, it's already begun. And there are various metrics and measures we could use to see how individual landowners and individual, individual institutions or mortgage markets, for example, are already thinking about risk. In this regard, the language that we would encourage you to think about would be individual agency. So we want individuals and individual institutions, individual businesses and collectives, civil collectives and also the public sector to be able to think about uh, education, information. Um, the literature that we, we read suggests that 
um, you know, every coastal residential property in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is losing something like $5,000 annually in lost appreciation because of risk that's being built into the market. My colleague at Tulane, um, um, uh, who focuses on this um, topic, um, is Jesse Keenan is interested in the notion of kind of gentrification through climate. And we know that places that are on higher ground, places that are you know, uh, regularly dry are already appreciating faster than those places that are beginning uh, on lower elevations to flood. And that ultimately as individuals are already making decisions, simply looking at the number of residential properties in this context, these are pr properties existing residential properties to date um, in the FEMA floodplain. Uh, now, again, simply saying that doesn't suggest what to do about that fact. It's simply a fact. In this case, something like $3.8 billion worth of residential property. And of course, the, the lives of thousands of people and their, and their, and, and their, and their families, not, not to mention the, the collective memory and lived experience of this place. So this diagram for me, again, is indicative. It doesn't tell us what to do, but it does give us, I think, a pretty interesting kind of x-ray of, okay, here's our situation. And knowing that that FEMA floodplain is going to only get worse going forward suggests to us that that would be one way of thinking about this. Um, one study that we've done, again, just for the, for the sake of thinking this through in a rigorous way is if individuals were to look to relocate, if, if individuals sought to retreat from coastal flooding, what, what might their options be? And so one of the studies we're interested to do going forward is how much available land, how many people that are living proximate to the coast now will be able to do so in 30 years or in 50 years. And of course, there's already pressure for housing on Cape Ann. You all know this as well as I do. Um, as we look at that, there are a menu of kind of strategies we see around the country, um, adding or authorizing accessory dwelling units and encouraging multiple units on lots that have historically been zoned for single family residential, infilling downtown areas and adding density where appropriate, up zoning around uh, access to transit, uh, trying to build in a low impact way, transferring development rights from unbuilt wetland parcels or ex things in the floodplain to other, there's a whole menu we have of these kinds of practices and strategies from around the country. Uh, one of the things we're interested in here is called a sea level rise adaptation land trust or SALT, which is a land trust that helps us to think about land ownership. There are many interesting examples of across the country. The idea of uh, sea level purchasing options or acquisition and buyout, either publicly or philanthropically, and also the idea of a rolling easement, easement or setback. These are all things being experimented and studied with across the country just now. And again, we're not making any judgments about them. We're not suggesting they're appropriate to you or not, but simply trying to provide the best available examples that we can find of people studying this right now. Um, in that regard, um, I think you know what, what, what we want to get to ultimately are the ability to imagine, well, okay, if these things are true, if these uh, scenarios are, are, are possible, what might that uh, do to help inform or shape decision-making? And, and in that regard, one of the things we're interested in is to think about a, a post-carbon Cape Ann, right? So I you know, opened my remarks this evening by, um, by thanking you all for, for spending some time with us and suggesting that, you know, if everyone in Cape Ann went, you know, decarbonized immediately, that would have a negligible impact on the effects of sea level rise and storm event that you will already begin to, to feel. Having said that, we are committed to the idea of looking at models of post-carbon economy and what that might mean. And so this last sub-scenario is beginning to look at electricity loads, for example, across Cape Ann. Uh, we appreciate that you've already got the three, the three windmills that they're an important, I think, icon. I don't know that they're doing a lot in terms of volume. Um, I know they're also quite controversial in this part of the world. In this regard, we would certainly be optimistic about looking at the potential for solar energy and the idea of solar energy, particularly for residential use. And we've begun to do, in this case, solar studies of undeveloped land, especially publicly owned undeveloped land across Cape Ann and its potential for solar power for new uh, development. Um, there are a number of other strategies that I, I won't get into great detail about, but a number of things being experimented with across the country that we've built a dossier around. Uh, among those, the idea of having maritime heritage districts, the idea of certain neighborhoods that will agree or allow to live with water or be flooded on a regular basis, 
the idea of certain neighborhoods uh, through a variety of mechanisms of decision making, either individual or collective, deciding to take a position with respect to either moving infrastructure, rebuilding and elevating, or simply living with the kind of nuisance flooding, as it's called uh, in Miami. Um, ultimately, that scenario one, which is ongoing, will continue and we will wrap up this summer with uh, another one of these presentations in September, uh, and then a website, uh, as well as a final report that we'll share uh, widely. But thank you all for the invitation. We've really enjoyed coming to know you all and to work with you a little bit. And uh, we've learned a lot. Uh, there's a lot more to learn, obviously. And as Dick mentioned, we're about halfway through, and we're looking forward to hearing your thoughts as we go forward. So I'll invite Dick and Valerie back to the helm. I'll put my yeah. email in the chat just so I'm a you know I'm publicly available at, at Harvard University. My name's uh, Charles Waldheim. Waldheim at Harvard.edu. Happy to happy to chat. Well, that was uh, quite an overview and comprehensive. And um, the uh, we have some questions. Uh, are you available for another 15 minutes? We've gone slightly, we're at eight now. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, great. So one question was about um, the Netherlands itself. Have they begun to uh, open up their natural systems and use them to defend also? Or uh, what is their, are they still just wedded completely to hard, hard infrastructure? Absolutely, Dick. Yeah, and thanks. Um, thanks for the question. Whoever put that in the chat. So, um, on the one hand, I think that there are a number of things that we can learn from the Dutch experience. On the other hand, there are things that are just utterly different and won't apply. Um, beginning in the 1950s, uh, in the wake of a very, very serious storm event, huge loss of life, um, the Dutch changed their national planning. You may know that the Dutch are kind of they have a series of organized water boards, which are like kind of like counties organized around water as a political structure. And they decided in the wake of this giant storm event in the 1950s that they had to reorganize themselves as a country to quote, make room for the river. So their larger program over the past couple of decades has been uh, less concerned on the North Sea because the, the, the techniques of dikes and pumps and the mechanisms of the polder landscape they are, of course, global experts at, and they are looking to export that expertise to every clay-based river in the world. And in that regard, the Dutch were less and less concerned about the ocean, actually. They're more and more concerned about what's coming down river from the Alps behind them, because they don't really have a political mechanism for dealing with that. So they decided beginning in the 50s and has been built out through the 70s and 80s to make room for the river and to devote um, portions of their land to uh, naturally occurring kind of wetlands and other forms of, uh, of, of natural landscapes. So as precisely to mitigate, to absorb storm events and to mitigate them uh, when they're in extremity. Um, they have been, the Dutch of course, have been you know, consulting you know, post Katrina in New Orleans and post Sandy uh, in New York, uh, but th those really apply in more clay-based river systems like the Netherlands, I would think, where their clay-based dikes and their kind of make room for the river strategy has worked quite well. Um, and I'm at two minutes, so let me stop there. Okay, great. So, um, the, as you know, the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than many other areas, and we're affected by the Gulf of Maine. So, how does that affect the scenarios and the sea level rise and the storm surge and all that? Sure, yeah, it's true. The Gulf of Maine, this part of the world is warming faster and rising faster than most other parts of the world. And um, when the conversation was really about mitigation, when it was really about, you know, what can we do about carbon and carbon in the atmosphere? Um, it wasn't immediately clear how that intersected with, you know, planning. I mean, of course, buildings use an enormous amount of carbon. Having said that, uh, now that the concern is shifting increasingly to adaptation. So in the work that we do, we rely upon scientists, uh, engineers, hydrological modelers, and we, 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 we have excellent information in that regard. We have no shortage of, of, of scientific data. Um, I would think that given the fact that this place is warming faster and rising faster than most other parts of the world, it would give us a sense of urgency about this. Um, in that regard, we are, uh, in this case, uh, building upon information with the Woods Hole Group, 
and working with people that you know study this and we rely upon their data as well as public sector officials um, who have both in NOAA and FEMA advised us. So in that regard, our focus would be less on, well, which precise projection for what rate of sea level rise, but rather the seas are rising. How do we think about everything else that that will implicate? Okay. Um, we have someone who uh, follows offshore wind a lot and he's asking, um, is raising, what about substations uh, and making them waterproof? And some of the wind farms are building subsea substations currently. Is that technology applicable here? Yeah, it's a great it's a great question. Uh, I think um, you know on the question of mitigation, certainly any anything that one could do to move our economy, to move our energy systems from a carbon based energy system toward a post carbon energy system would be a good thing, both net good but also locally good. I think um, in that regard, uh, wind, geothermal, solar. Um, you, you know, a range, there are a range of, you know, renewable resources that are available. Um, the Europeans have been, you know, quite ambitious with respect to their offshore wind farms. And if you've been in the North Sea and seen these things, they are quite extraordinary. So uh, they're not inexpensive. They require a lot of political organization and a lot of capital. Uh, some people find them unsightly. They come with uh, some uh, significant environmental disruptions. Having said that, uh, they might be a part of the solution. So when you start to think about, you know, the post-carbon, you know, energy uh, kind of profile, uh, there are places that have decided that offshore wind farms are appropriate for them. And there are other places that have said no. In, in the United States, generally speaking, uh, coastal communities find them distasteful visually, um, and they will also find them more desirable if they're further away. For example, in Texas, right? When, if, you, if you've fl flown over the the, the, the western part of the country, you'll see uh, the kind of the wind farms there are kind of gangbusters. Uh, but again, I'll leave it to Cape Banners to decide whether they want wind farms visible or not on the horizon. But certainly, if you want to decarbonize your economy, it's one option on the table. So this is just a fascinating question, and I don't know if there's any answer. But what someone's asking: What decade do you anticipate that the sea level will cease to rise? I don't think we have evidence that it will. Um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, I, I was born in Florida, I was born and raised in, in, in Florida. And if you look at a place like that, you know, the, the central runway, the top of the central runway at Miami International is plus eight feet <laughs> against a certain mean sea level. Right? So, so in that context, um, what the science tells me is that we don't have any evidence that it will stop. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of what I thought, but I wanted to hear you your answer to that. Um, and the, the, the corollary would also be, of course, it's, it's, it's doing so within certain increments. And of course, we'll know more, right? It's the famous line, it's too early to tell. But based on our work in the US and cities, we can see there's already evidence of climate change that's, that's evident on a daily basis. So we don't need to wait for further information on that level. My goal right now is to try to focus us uh, not just on mitigation, but to think more about you know, the practicalities of preparing both economic and political decision making. Which is uh, more affordable, uh, elevating or relocating? Um, it, it, it depends upon how much you're doing. Um, um, they also tend to be different responses in different contexts. So these responses tend to be very contextually dependent. Um, in principle, one of the reasons that we do this kind of work is that we find that a, a strictly you know, bottom line, and that wasn't what the question was posing, but a strictly bottom line, simple you know, cost benefit analysis, the, the, the information available immediately overwhelms that. So let, let's take a case in, in point. So you're talking about Manchester by the sea and its town hall and its harbor. Um, what is the cultural value of that? You know? how much expense over how long a period of time for how many people is worth enduring, elevating and defending, and at what point and in which ways do you decide, okay, enough. Those are you know, longer term questions that will be decided not by us, but by future populations. Ultimately, in certain contexts, what we see as case studies around the country are communities that are chronically flooding, places where maintaining those most often roads and sewers over time becomes you know, financially and politically not viable. 
those places will have a very different answer or response than places where the center of your economy, you know, the center of your of your old, you know, fishing harbor is based upon both the ongoing fish economy and industry, but also the ongoing tourist economy is based on a mile and a half of commercial center. In those contexts, generally speaking, people decide to defend and elevate and hang in precisely because of the meaning of those places. In other places that are more peripheral, where it might be you know, more problematic to maintain over time, tougher choices ensue. Kira, I wanna give you a word here. What, what else would you add to that response? Thanks, Charles. Um, yeah, I would say that there's also benefits to both of those strategies. So you can spend all the money in the world elevating your structures um, and that may defend against sea level rise, but then if you have a massive storm surge, we've talked a little bit in the first EPA presentation um, about the danger of high winds, high waves. And so if you have a dramatic storm surge that comes in and damages your property, that elevation might have been good incrementally uh, to respond to that gradual sea level rise, but then at a certain point it may be advantageous to relocate. And so there it's not really a specific set question of this is the right thing to do, but perhaps over time, uh, relocation becomes more of a feasible strategy. Thanks, Kira. And and in that regard, is if, if we look around, we look around the U.S., we look at cities that are experiencing this. Of course, you know, there are American cities that have decided to elevate themselves. You know, Seattle, you know, the, the entire kind of central business district of Chicago. These were cities that elevated an entire level uh, in the 19th century. Um, both our economies and our environmental you know, regulations suggest something different today. Um, but ultimately, um, a, a part of what we would try to bring to that conversation would be to think about the critical path, critical path in terms of decision making, but also finance. So one of the things we'll include in our report at the end of the summer will be a menu of strategies, practices, both you know, funding agencies, but also decision making. And what we found in a city like Miami Beach, for example, is that individuals were already making their own choices. They were already setting their own base elevations in response to the information that they had. And therefore you have, in most cases, a kind of piecemeal effort. Um, there are other contexts where the Corps of Engineers are invoked or uh, the state funding comes in and you have a larger infrastructure. So we tend to think of it as on the one hand, infrastructures need to be connected to be workable. Uh, we would wanna recommend keeping the train connection, of course. We would of course wanna elevate that and defend that. We of course wanna keep the critical life safety and key infrastructures uh, above water and viable. At some point, the distribution and extremity of people living on the water's edge is a part of why we're here. And of course, we wouldn't wanna lose that. And so it's often a set of trade-offs and they're individuals, families, uh, community groups, individual districts or neighborhoods. And then of course, we're then looking for larger civic actors, you know, philanthropic actors. Um, in, in certain contexts, you know, foundations step up and take a responsible role. In other cases, it's, you know, NGOs and civic organizations such as the one convened here this evening. Um, I think it's, uh, it's 8.15 and I think it's uh, in the interest of um, your time and, and so forth. I think we'd like to wrap it up. I think your offer to take email questions is fantastic. Thank you so much. I'd just like to um, tell everybody that you can register for the EPA second workshop, which is going to be this Monday, the 23rd at 9 a.m. starting at 8.55. So we can start right on time at nine. And Professor Waldheim will be there uh, and giving a presentation related to what he said today. And there'll be some small group discussions and we'll be discussing priority setting and then how we go forward from here civically. I'd also like to say that Town Green is working actively now with our state and federal legislators to get some money to fund second year of work with uh, Dr. Waldheim and his staff uh, looking at natural systems as he's alluded to as the potential for really helping us buffer. If we identify the, the baseline and we help strengthen them, they can help us be one of the factors that is actually one of the less costly factors in terms of protecting us from, from this uh, threat of climate change. And uh, then beyond that, we're looking for some federal money for fiscal year 23 that would start in fall of 23 that would be looking at what is the best practices for 
the tools for collective decision making to prioritize and move us ahead. And there are people who have done good work on this. Uh, we'd be doing some of our own innovation and working with um, the professor in Harvard at some of the best practices in this area. And I think that's one of the most important things here because we, the will to actually do something in a way that engages the whole population uh, and brings us together rather than makes us have more conflict is something we can really hope to strive for. And I hope that Town Green and the Cape May Climate Coalition uh, can play a role in that. So I wanna thank everybody and uh, wanna thank Particularly, I see Greg Fetishfield's here, and uh, as town administrator of Manchester, he's got a lot of great knowledge. He's been very strong in advocating, working with Valerie Nelson and myself, working with Professor Waldheim and uh, Kira Klingen and um, their staff. So thank you very much. And we'll be talking more in the future and having more of these events. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Dick, for hosting and for your leadership on this. Stay well, everyone. Bye-bye.